Uh, Dr. Darren McAleer, who was over the Methodist home in Macon, children and youth home, he does a lot of wonderful things for this wonderful Methodist mission that we have that helps helps children and youth that, uh, that may not be able to celebrate in the way we do uh, and understand what Mother's Day is about. A lot of them are uh, tough situations, but they're wonderful kids, they're loving kids, they just need a good direction, and that's what the youth children and youth home does. It gives them a good place to start and get them in the right direction. I'm not going to speak any longer. I'm going to sit down with my family and enjoy a wonderful message. If y'all would, please give a wonderful welcome to Brother Derek back on there. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Glad to be with you today. We're going to be in Deuteronomy 31 and in John 14 in a minute. And if you want to just sort of find those and stick your finger in them, because when we pull them out, we'll be going quickly. I want to bring you greetings from Dr. Steve Rumford, our president and CEO, and 135 boys and girls we serve at six different campuses across Georgia. Last five years, we've served short from 107 of Georgia's 159 counties. We're not quite statewide, but we're working on it pretty hard. And you know why? Because that's where boys and girls in need are. And that's who we're going to serve. You got a little insert in your bulletin that tells you a little bit about the home and keeps me from having to give you all that boring stuff. It's got our contact info on it and a little bit of details about us. A little thank you note. How many of y'all came up to make it a couple weeks ago for the celebration day? Hope you had a good time. Hope you come back again. We have a lot of fun about it every year. How many of you sent stuff to us? They brought a ton of poultry supplies. I want to thank you for that. That seems like a simple thing, but let me tell you. Every young lady on my campus is just like every young lady I know. They want to look good, they want to feel good, they want to smell good. They want to see themselves as beautiful, attractive people. But one of the realities of being a battered and abused and other issues child is they don't have to look good themselves. Some of y'all are fortunate enough, you're sitting by a little brochure, if I get bored, uh, if you've got something to read, which you may like. If I get real bored, reach across the person next to you, the one in the middle, sitting on a magazine. It's got about 30 pages in it, so if I'm really dumb, you may want to read that. But one thing you'll notice in all of our publications, every picture of a child is a happy, smiling child. I know we can put these pictures of the sad child in the, in the shades of gray, in the window, in the rain, you know, until I get your heart. But let me tell you, every time the gateway comes out, the boys go to home. First thing they do is go grab it, flip through it, they look to see if they're in this issue. And they see themselves in there, and that's the picture they have of themselves. And one of our desires is to make sure every time they see themselves, they see themselves as somebody who succeeds, who's doing good, who's going to be okay. And visual pictures are a big part of that. So I want to thank you for your, uh, your willingness to, to help us with that. Do you, uh, you remember when you were a child? Do you remember what you were scared of when you were a kid? Uh, yeah. Anybody remember being scared of monsters under the bed? Spiders. Uh -huh. And you want to know something? I thought that you know, my mom always said it's make-believe, but I see the movie now, and it's true, isn't it? Yeah. There really are monsters in the closet under the bed. Okay. So, oh, it has to be so. <laughs> you all remember being scared of John? Even though Daddy said he'd catch you. Any Dad, remember? I remember sitting under the diving board in the pool and treading water. Come on, come on, jump. I've been here 25 minutes. I'm about to die. Come on. You know? <coughs> Do you remember being scared? I watched children come to our church or to our preschool. Clinging to mama's leg, you know, she's walking along with this permanent limp because she's got this child wrapped around her leg. Because they're in a strange place and the child is scared. And what do you do when you're scared? You go cling to somebody, you know? Do you ever remember being afraid that your parents might leave you when you were a kid? I, I can remember being worried about my position in the family. It didn't help that my older brother told me that they weren't my real family. <laughs> and then one day my true parents would come and take me back and then he wouldn't have to put up with me anymore. That, that, you know. <laughs> I remember when I was young, my mother had cancer and I remember being worried that she was going to 
going to die and would just leave me and I'd be alone. I remember being afraid that I'd come home from school one day and the house would be empty and I wouldn't know what to do and I'd be off. Do you remember those kind of fears? I mean, my basic connection in life was with my mom and my dad and my two brothers and my sister. And I wanted to feel connected. But later on, I went to college and I went to, to, took all these psychology courses and I learned fancy things to describe that. I learned about Harry Harlow's experiments with Reese's monkeys, where he took monkeys and put them in isolation, but he took a little wire frame, put a styrofoam ball head, and wrapped the frame up in a terry cloth towel. And the little baby monkeys, when they got frightened, would go cling to that little terry cloth towel and freak you. That was the closest thing to Mama that was in the room. I remember learning about Abraham Maslow's hierarchy of needs. I'm just bothered if you can't, I don't stay at one place. <laughs> I remember learning about Abraham Maslow's hierarchy of needs where you start off with the need for shelter and for food, and then you work your way up the pyramid till you get to whatever self actualization is. What I remember is the need to be connected is down there at the bottom, two levels. The need to belong. I went to college and learned all kinds of fancy ways to describe what I knew as a child. We don't like to be alone, do we? I learned about how animals in the wild would be isolated from their packs. Some of them don't know how to deal with it and end up just dying. Of course, I should have known. The book of Genesis says what? It was not good, what? That a man would live alone. To be alone, to be cut off. I mean, here we are today, and, and you know, Mother's Day is always a precious day for folks, but there's always somebody it's the first Mother's Day without. There's always somebody for whom it's a very tender time because you feel alone. And to be alone in some way is to begin to die. I grew up listening to my mother came, she would come home from church and while she cooked dinner, the prescribed menu was either rice and gravy, butter beans and fried chicken or roast with the, the onions and the lifted onion soup mix and all of that and gravy and rice and butter beans. <laughs> we, we, we're pretty standard eaters in my house. And she put tennis here and four records on. That's what my mama thought. You ought to listen to it the way you ought to raise your children. So I learned all about that little thick and hard, 16 tons and all that stuff. But he also sang spiritual songs. One song tennis here and four and sang was, Sometimes I feel like a motherless child. Don't know that hymn? Long, long. Do you ever feel like a motherless child a long way from home? I want to tell you, I, I got a campus full of them. We, uh, I, I guess you know, you may not know, we, we admit children mostly ages 7 to 17. We don't admit them older 17 because they're adults at that point. They don't get admitted. We'll keep them after that. I got 14 children in college right now. Anybody want to help pay tuition? <laughs> and we don't admit them younger than that, generally speaking, because our boys and girls live in a cottage with 10 children. And a four-year-old doesn't need to live in a cottage with 10 children. That's too chaotic. They need more individualized, one-on-one -on -one attention than that really allows. But we get most of our kids because the courts call us up and defects call us up. They'll read the papers where some awful thing has happened and Authorities go in and they remove the children. Well, just ask yourself, where did they take them? The child got to sleep somewhere that night. Where are they going? A lot of them are one of our kids. We got a little boy when he was, uh, when he was, I do not know when his daddy left him. When he was three years old, his mother left him. And the way that he found out that his mother left him was she got up one morning and she fed him breakfast and she put him in front of the TV. Then she went back in the bedroom. He did not know 
this. He was watching TV. She called her mother, and then she went out the back door. Her mother lived in another community. It took her a little over an hour to get there. And during that time, he got up and wandered around the house. He wanted more breakfast, and he went to find Mama. So he went to the kitchen, Mama. Wasn't anybody there. He went to the bedroom, Mama. Wasn't anybody there. And he went up and down and through the house, Mama, Mama. Until Grandma got there, which he didn't know Grandma was coming. And Grandma took him home to be with her. When he was six years old, he's in school, and um, y'all know most teachers are pretty competent people. They're capable. They know what to do with a six-year-old. He was in school, and he'd acted out in some little way, and his teacher uh, did what many teachers do, and that is she put him in time out in her room. Time out was a door, was a chair in the hallway just outside the door. I want to ask Mark how many times you sat in that chair because your child's here. You know. <laughs> but she went to put him outside in that chair by himself and closed the door, and the boy went berserk. He started throwing things, screaming, yelling, tore the room up. The teacher in a minute called him to the office and said, I need some help. And the principal came in and said, You don't get to be the principal of elementary school without being a pretty competent, capable woman, man, you know? They know what to do. Most principals are able to handle a six-year-old. The principal went down the room and called the police. The police came to the school and got the board. He ended up coming to us. Now, I want to give the teacher a fair shake. Because the teacher didn't know something critical. Nobody had told the teacher why the child was living with grandmama, what the family situation was, what the child's fears were. She had no idea how he would react to what he perceived as being alone and abandoned. She was just trying to get a little order in class. She'd sit him outside for three or four minutes. He'll calm down. We'll bring him back in. School will go on. Because deep back doesn't tell you everything you need to know. They just give you the child. He ended up coming to us. Since then, we've learned a few other things. Boy, is a handful. He is a little bad of rooster. He will stand right up to you. I ain't scared of nothing. Ah! I mean, the boy is something. <coughs> but we've also learned that like with so many children, behind that tough exterior is a little scared kid. He's a little scared kid whose number one fear is that he will be alone. So you know what? We don't leave him alone. We don't put him in time out in another room. If he's in time out, he goes in the office with one of the staff and sits in there with them. We don't make him be alone ever. If he comes out of his room at night and wants to tag along with the night duty the staff, they make him sit down and be still and hope that the child will go back to sleep, but they don't make him go be by himself. Why would you want to do it? We want to help the boy. The other thing we've learned about him is his deep, dark secret is he does have another very clear memory of his mother. Not just that morning with breakfast, but sometime the week before, as near as we can tell, of waking up in the middle of the night with her hands around him. Which is likely why she called Grandma and said, come get the boy, I'm out of here. She's on all kinds of drugs, does all kinds of the little boy is a handful. Let me tell you. But 